Hi, my name is John. I work for Zoll Medical, and today we're going to be talking about the basics of ventilation. Uh, this is part one of a two-part video series that I'll be making. The first part of the video, the basics of ventilation, the stuff that you need to know to understand how to ventilate somebody. Uh, part two is going to be using just our ventilator, talking to you about our product specifically, how to manipulate it, how to go into different modes and everything else. So if you are new to ventilation, you should probably start off with part one. If you are experienced and maybe a critical care, uh, critical care experience and have used ventilators for a while, then perhaps you might want to start with part two. A little bit of background on me. My name is John. Like I said, I live in Florida. I started my career back in 97 as a firefighter paramedic. And in 2012, I went to nursing school. I started working in an ER and an ICU in Orlando at a level one trauma center. And I did that for about five years before I got hired by Zoll. Um, so that's, that's a little bit about me. So we're going to start talking a little bit about ventilation and the things that you need to know. So a couple things that uh, I usually start off the class with is why would we ever want to go to a ventilator? Um, what are the benefits of it? Why wouldn't we just stick with a BVM? It's a lot cheaper. It's a lot more cost effective. We've been using them for years. Why not just stick with BVMs? Uh, and the reason for that is, is if you're in critical care transport, you know about acid-base balance. And the problem with using a BVM is you can change somebody's pH level very, very quickly. Matter of fact, it's the quickest way to change somebody's pH level short of IV bicarb by changing the way you're ventilating them. And you can change their CO2 levels, which will obviously change their pH levels, by changing the rate and volume that you're ventilating your patient with. So the problem with using a BVM is we don't have a very good idea of what our tidal volume is every single time we squeeze that bag. We don't know what the volume is that's going in with every breath. Matter of fact, it changes with every breath and with every different provider who's ventilating the patient. So the first thing is, is obviously when you're using a BVM, we have no idea what the tidal volume is. The second thing is the rate. We know that when we count, especially in critical situations, we don't do a great job of counting. That's why we have those metronomes on our CPR um, machines and on our AEDs and in our defibrillators. They help us look at that and they give us CPR feedback to get us back on track. So we know that when we're in a critical situation, we can't count very well. So when we're trying to count and we're trying to ventilate somebody 12 breaths a minute or whatever the number might be, it, it's very difficult to get an exact number and to do it exactly and precisely. And again, by changing the rate and tidal volume, that's where we throw off some of these CO2 levels. So that's why it's really important that you use a ventilator because then you're giving exact rates and exact tidal volumes. There's also a couple other reasons why you might wanna use a ventilator. Um, AHA for the longest time has said that in order to get a good mass seal, you need to ventilate with a two-handed EC clamp. So that means you're gonna dedicate one person to a simple EC clamp holding that mask in place. I know in EMS, we usually don't have enough people on scene to do that. Perhaps with an air transport service, you might be able to do that. You might have enough hands there, but most agencies don't have enough hands to sit there and dedicate one person to just mass seal. So with the ventilator, the nice thing is, is you can turn it on, you can have somebody holding mass seal and it will ventilate your patient for you. You don't have to dedicate one person to mass seal and another person to, sit, to ventilate the patient. The last reason, and probably one of the most important reasons, is because you want to make sure that you don't want to exceed certain pressures in the airway. If you exceed a certain pressure in the airway, it closes all the sphincters going down to the airway, and it causes the air to go, instead of into the lungs, it goes into the esophagus, it gives you gastric distension, and with gastric distension, we know what happens there. Um, so we might have a compromised airway with vomiting and everything else. So using a ventilator gives you the exact rate and exact tidal volume, it allows you to get a single person to do an EC clamp with two-handed technique to give mass seal and to ventilate your patient. And it also never exceeds the certain pressures that you program it to. So you don't have to worry about the added risk of gastric distension. I'm not going to tell you it's not going to cause gastric distension if you don't have somebody intubated, but it minimizes the opportunity for that. So that's why it's a lot better to use a ventilator. So let's start talking about what you need to know on ventilation. Um, you have to have a couple of concepts down pretty well before we can even talk about our ventilator or anybody else's ventilator for that matter. You have to understand thoroughly what PIP is and what PEEP is. And if I were to ask people, I know I've, I've, before this COVID stuff, I used to travel all over the place. 
And I would ask the students in class, I'd say, you know, what, what, is, what is PIP and what is PEEP and describe it for me. And the general consensus from everybody is, is well, we know what PEEP is. PEEP is positive end expiratory pressure. I said, okay, that's what PEEP stands for, but what is it? And then that's where I usually get a lot of blank looks. They're like, well, we add PEEP, uh, we give five, we start at five, we go up from there and that's, it's positive pressure that helps with the air or something. That's, that, I don't get a very good answer. So I wanna make sure that you guys have a really good grasp of what PEEP is. So what PEEP is, is like we said, it's positive end expiratory pressure. It's pressure in the airway at the end of exhalation. So the way it works is with the normal lung, your lung inflates and then it deflates. And as it inflates and deflates, the alveoli that are inside the distal ends of the lungs, they're popped open and they remain open. And when they are open, gas exchange occurs in the alveoli. So that's how the healthy lung works, right? We get gas exchange at the alveoli, it goes through, um, and we keep our oxygen saturations up. By doing so, we get rid of the CO2. So that's, that's how the healthy lung works. The problem is, is with the unhealthy lung, sometimes you can get alveoli that start to collapse. And what happens there is the lung inflates and the alveoli will pop open. But then when the lung goes to deflate again, the alveoli collapse. And when they collapse, no gas exchange occurs. So it's almost as if that part of the lung is non-existent when it comes to raising somebody's oxygen saturations. And that's probably something you've seen in the field where you've had somebody who's been on and on a breather for an extended period of time. You, um, have them on 100% oxygen, and you look at them and their O2 sats are in the low 80s. Uh, the only other option you might have, unless you have CPAP or bi-level, is to intubate your patient. You intubate the patient, make sure everything's in the right place, the tube's in the right spot, you got good waveform capnography, everything is going well, except for the O2 sats. They're still in the mid 80s or low 80s. And you're going, man, what the heck is going on? Well, if they're all the alive collapsed, there's no amount of oxygen or air or volume or anything that you can do to raise their O2 stats. Really, there's only two ways to increase somebody's oxygen saturations. You can raise them by giving them more oxygen, meaning I can give somebody who's on a nasal cannula at two liters a minute, if I put them at six liters a minute, they should theoretically have a higher O2 stat. The second thing I can do is I can add PEEP. And what PEEP does is, is it recruits the alveoli, it causes them to pop open and remain open, and it causes gas exchange to occur. So let's talk about that unhealthy lung now when we start adding PEEP. So when you don't have PEEP, the lung inflates and it deflates. And as it inflates, the alveoli pop open and stay open. And then when the lung deflates, the alveoli collapse again. So what we do is we now add positive end expiratory pressure, right? At the end of exhalation, the alveoli collapse, but now we're gonna add pressure at the end of exhalation. And by adding pressure at the end of exhalation, we cause those alveoli when they pop open and when they go to collapse, we have that pressure there to keep them open. And by keeping them open, it allows gas exchange to occur. So that's what PEEP does, that's how it works. And it works in a really cool fashion. Um, it works in a cumulative fashion. And what I mean by that is, for example, if you have your lung and you inflate it, Let's assume and say that there's a number. I don't know what that number is. I'm gonna pick five, and it's certainly a lot more than five, but let's say five alveoli pop open. Well, when you add PEEP, those five alveoli pop open, stay open, gas exchange occurs. The next breath, something interesting happens. Another five pop open and stay open, and then another five, and another five, and another five. So it works cumulatively. So now, that is called, and you've probably heard this term several times, it's called alveolar recruitment. They'll, they'll talk about recruiting the alveoli. And that happens with every single breath because we keep those five open, we take another breath, another five are open, another five are open, another five, until we recruit the entire lung. And as we do that, the alveoli pop open, remain open, gas exchange occurs, O2 stats go up. So that is the theory behind PEEP. So PEEP sounds like a wonderful thing. And it really is. We, we normally start everybody at five of PEEP. And why is that? So we start everybody at five of PEEP because we have to compensate for all the dead space in the, e, in the ET tube, in the tubing on that ventilator and everything else. So we start them a little bit higher than what their physiological norm is. The physiological norm on most people is about two or three of PEEP. So 
somebody who's awake and alert, conscious, breathing on their own, the muscles and their airways and everything, keep everything sealed off and keep a little bit of pressure inside those lungs. They don't let it all go out. So we normally maintain and retain about two or three of PEEP. So when we go to give somebody PEEP, we give them just slightly above their physiological norm and compensate for that dead space. So we give them about five of PEEP. So in reality, all we're doing is adding another two or, two or so of PEEP to the person who is getting five of PEEP. But the problem is, is sometimes too much of a good thing can be a bad thing. And what I mean by that is, is when you give PEEP, you're adding pressure inside the thoracic cavity. And when you add pressure inside the thoracic cavity, just like with attention pneumo, you can put pressure onto some of the organs in your body. And when you do that, for example, on your heart, you start to drop cardiac output, your blood pressure will start to drop. So one of the things that we have to look out for is all that added pressure we're putting inside the thoracic cavity could cause cardiac output to drop, which could cause your blood pressure to drop. So when you're doing, when you're ventilating somebody and you're adding PEEP, you have to always keep an eye out on their blood pressure and make sure it doesn't go down to a point that is lower than what your protocols tell you to do. So we start at five of PEEP, and because we're always looking at blood pressures, we titrate the PEEP up slowly in very, very small increments, usually about one or two. And then we check and see the blood pressure and see how they handle. We see what their O2 sets are, and we figure it out. So like I said, there's only two ways to increase somebody's oxygen saturation. The first way is by adding PEEP, or the other way is by giving them more oxygen. Those are the only two ways. You can increase somebody's rate and tidal volume all you want. All that's going to do is change their CO2 level. Remember at the beginning we said to change somebody's CO2 level, you add more tidal volume or you give them a higher rate. That is how you change their CO2 level. So that should be a pretty thorough discussion on PEEP for you. That tells you everything you need to understand about it. So here's, here's like a summary or a takeaway that you need to understand about PEEP. So PEEP is a good thing. So the takeaways are, PEEP raises your O2 sats by popping your alveoli open, and we should always keep an eye on blood pressure. That's really what you need to understand when it comes to PEEP.